This is series number one, Secrets by Tom Allen. This was posted September the 4th, 2012, but it is good information for today. Hi, Susan for SLC Aquatics here. Just wanted to come to you with a little special uh, series that I'm doing on guppies. And some of the uh, articles that I've been reading lately came from Tom Allen, who is a member of the International Fancy Guppy Association, International Association. And um, he has a list that I'd like to share with the people today of some of the secrets that um, you need to know about raising fancy guppies. One of them is uh, size is as much a result of genetics as um, it is of feeding. If you're working with a strain of fish which have been inbred to the point where generation after generation you breed small fish. Nothing short of an outcross to a compatible strain will make bigger fish. Consider the opposite as well. You can disguise poor feeding habits if you have a strain which is genetically big. A second secret that you need to know are males reach 90 percent of their final body size within four to six months of birth. Does it pay to continue to feed baby brine, etc. for the remaining 10%? Wouldn't you be better served by giving this extra boost to younger fry? I've thought about that. A third secret is two feedings of baby brine each day are 10 times better than one feeding. Let me repeat that. Two feedings of baby brine shrimp in one day is better than ten times, is ten times better than one feeding. Hatch more than you need to for main meal and then keep the remainder in some brine solution with an air stone. Don't forget to rinse before you feed. Feed only to growing fish. If they're not growing, they've reached full adult size, stop feeding the baby brine shrimp and go back to a high quality flake food or alternate with other types of frozen or live food. Four, you don't have to feed 12 times per day to get big fish. Four to six quality meals will do just as well. 12 meals most times get you dirty polluted tanks and stressed and diseased fish. The fifth secret. Work is not an excuse for not feeding. You can easily develop a feeding program which takes advantage of the time you're at home. Make it convenient for yourself. Fit meals in during commercials. Feed more. Feed before work. Feed after work. Just feed. And um, another secret, which would be number six, newly hatched baby brine shrimp is the A number one food that you can give your fish. Let me repeat that. Newly hatched baby brine shrimp is the A number one food that you can give your fish. Following right behind a frozen beef heart. There's no question that there are a lot more exotic blends and mixes with expensive ingredients, but the above two foods coupled with two to four feedings of quality food each day should give your fish the size that you want. 
One word of caution, though. The smallest of babies cannot recognize frozen beef heart for its food value, and it may go uneaten. Number seven, don't skimp on portions. So what if there's a live brine shrimp, uh, shrimp swimming around in the tank while you're away at work? Isn't this ideal? The very best food in front of your fish all day long. Try to feed more than you think the fish will eat. Yes, your water may get a little cloudy, but what are you shooting for, big fish or clear water? As long as the fish are healthy, who cares? And then another secret, number eight, don't put little fish in big tanks. How do you expect them to grow if they cannot find the food? And that's one of the um, important features, secrets that I'd like to share with the viewers right now. Most of my grow out tanks are five and 10 gallon grow out tanks. And I learned years ago that you don't put fry in a 20 and a 40 gallon tank. They won't be able to find the food. Plus there's going to be more current in the larger tanks and you need a tank that's small like 5 to 10 gallons with little to no current and constant food in the water column for fry. Number nine, when good shrimp eggs are available take advantage of the situation and stock up. I've gone through two or three, I can't remember, periods when good hatching eggs were impossible to get. Spend the extra money now and who knows how long the good eggs will be available. Also, strip the inedible shells off any poorly hatching eggs to take it full advantage of their food value. Your fish will eat these shell stripped eggs and as long as you rinse thoroughly with clean water, there will not be any adverse reactions to this food. Number 10 and final secret that Tom Allen shares with us, look for compatible lines and strains for outcrosses. Pass your quality line to other members in your club to ensure having a well strengthened strain. Well, there it is in a nutshell, he says. Now there are no more secrets in our hobby. <laughs> if you'd like me to um, share the link with you, I will do so in the description. Hi, Susan for SLC Aquatics here bringing you another series to our fancy guppies and I was going to bring out another uh, informational uh, video on foods and feeding but I find that and before we get into more in depth of the types of foods that are good for our guppies I wanted to bring out some genetic points okay we want to talk about colors we want to talk about uh, body sizes and uh, we also want to bring out um, recessive and recessive and dominant traits and crosses that work good together. This information is also from Tom Allen of the Guppy Associates International Chicago. This was posted January the 21st, 2013. Simple genetics. Guppies like humans have 23 chromosomes. Lined up on these 23 chromosomes are thousands of genes which determine traits that the fish will exhibit. During a mating, genes, one from the male and one from the female in positional order, combine to, perform, combine to form excuse me, the visible and invisible traits that the parents will pass to their offspring. Some traits take the combining of only one gene. Others, like the excellent red color in guppies we all work towards, take as many as four genes to complete. If you fish, if your fish only have one or two or even three of these needed red genes, you will never produce young 
which exhibit the super red color without crossing to another unrelated red strain. There are two terms in genetic theory that it would be that would be appropriate to define to define at this point. Excuse me, my tongue is tied. One is phenotype, which is the appearance of the fish. Two is genotype, which is the genetics of the fish. Let's repeat that. These are genetic, these are terms in genetic theory that would be appropriate to define at this point. Number one, phenotype, that's P-H-E-N-O-T-Y-P-E, -E, which is the appearance of the fish. Two is genotype, G-E-N-O-T-Y-P-E, -E, which is the genetics of the fish. When entering your fish in a show, or any other show that matter, it is the appearance of the fish, the phenotype, that the judges are concerned about. If it is a gold, it should look like a gold. If it doesn't look gold, even though it comes from a gold strain, the genotype, it's likely to be disqualified. Here are some simple genetic illustrations. With gold, it's defined as the fish, male or female, that has at least 25% yellow gold color in the body, like a gold wedding band. The caudal fin can be any color. To obtain 100% genetic golds in a dropping, both male and female must carry the gold gene. It is positional and always appears in the same location on the same chromosome in guppies. That means that you can cross two different gold strains and be assured of always getting 100% gold babies in each dropping. That's nice. Since there are so many other genes that play into, into making a quality fish, you may get gold, but they may not be good golds. If you outcross a gold with a non-gold, 100% of the dropping will show the non-gold trait in the F1 generation. Let me repeat that. If you outcross a gold with a non-gold, 100% of the offspring will show the non-gold trait in the F1 generation. However, all the fish in the dropping will carry the gold gene. It's recessive. Crossing brother with sister from this drop of young will produce the F2 generation with on average 25% of the fish being gold in appearance and 75% will be non-gold which means two-thirds of these non-golds are recessive gold, but they all appear as non-gold. Have I confused you? <laughs> oh, a lot of information from my brain. There's also um, bronze. There's also albino. Some are very interested in the albino, so let's go there. Albino is a fish, male or female, that has red or pink eyes regardless of body color. There are pr presently two classes for albinos. One is the red albino and two is any other color, AOC. Like gold and bronze, albinos follow an identical genetic pattern with the gene for al albin albinism, albinism being located in the same position on the same chromosome in every albino strain. Thus, 
cross any two albino strains and you will always get albino. If you cross any albino strain together, you will always get albino. That's good to know. The genes for gold, bronze, and albino, which positionally on the chromosomes, are at different locations, meaning that if you cross a gold with an albino, you should get 100% non-gold, non-albino young in the first one F1 generation. Then snake skins. I come up with a lot of snake skins with my outcrossings. By definition, it is a male guppy that has an unbroken rosetta pattern covering at least 60% of the body. Females show no snake skin pattern. The gene for the snake skin trait can be on the Y chromosome passed from the father to the son or on the X chromosome passed from the mother to the son. The only way to determine where the gene lies is to outcross to a non-snake skin strain and check the F1 males for the pattern. That's enough information on genetics for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll pick up next time with um, half blacks and sword tails. Thank you, Susan, for SLC Aquatics. See you next time.